Today is Tuesday, December 13th, 2022, and my name is Kathy Fussell. I'm sitting in here with my husband. Fred Fussell. We are in our home in Columbus, Georgia, where we live in Swift Mill Lofts, and we also have studios here in Swift Mill Lofts. Fred paints and draws and takes photographs and writes, and I make art quilts. Um, and we have, in recent years, started to collaborate on uh, my art quilts. And one of the reasons we do that is that I wanted to make uh, narrative quilts, figurative quilts. I'd been making uh, quilts inspired by maps and quilts uh, using traditional quilt patterns, but I wanted to make more figurative quilts. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that is that I taught literature, uh, primarily Southern literature, but I taught literature for 28 years and uh, I wanted to incorporate a lot of my love for that literature in the visual art that I was making. And I don't draw, I don't draw well at all. I can barely draw a stick figure, but Fred draws well. So I approached Fred and asked him if he would draw some scenes for me from Southern Lit, and he agreed to do that. And so we've been working at it for several years now. We started out with a pretty strict method, and we've, uh, we, we still have a method that's not quite as, as strict, but it still works. And I, I'm very pleased with what we're doing, and I enjoy the work. And um, of course, I think we've collaborated on our artwork over the years in uh, in other ways too. I mean, if Fred's in, a, in the, working on a painting, he'll ask me to give it a, a look, you know, and, I, and I'm the same with any kind of, any of my quilt work. I'll call Fred into my studio and ask him, what do you think about this? But the, the, the literature pieces that we're working on now are really deliberate uh, collaborations. Um, I should uh, say that we actually work in adjacent spaces. Kathy has her work in, in a room that's adjacent to the space where I have uh, an easel and other uh, materials and equipment set up for painting and drawing, or for writing. And, but, those spaces are not completely separated. They're, they're joining, but there's an open opening at, up toward the ceiling between the two spaces. So we can actually talk back and forth to each other, <laughs> even, even though we're not in the same, exactly in the same rooms. And uh, that happens a lot, um, especially if one of us runs into some difficulty or has a question or is unsure about uh, which direction to go in, I'll say, Kathy, come take a look at this, see what you think, and she'll do the same. So uh, in that way, we, we collaborate. We've, that's kind of an indirect way, but much more indirect than it is when we're working together on a specific project that we kind of have co-visualized and understand, we both understand how it's eventually, hopefully, going to turn out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We holler over the, holler over the kitchen through that hole in the wall a lot. Um, uh, uh, let's talk about the first real collaboration we had on art quilts, and that was when we did the graphic novel version of As I Lay Dying. And that came about because on Facebook, I was having a discussion with some of my friends about quilting, and somebody suggested, why don't you quilt To Kill a Mockingbird? And I wasn't thrilled about quilting To Kill a Mockingbird at that point in time. And then my real good friend, Marion Fletcher, with whom I talked for many years, and. Marion knows how much I love As I Lay Dying because she loves it that much too. And Marion said, Kathy, why don't you quilt As I Lay Dying? So that, I said, what a great idea. Why had I not thought of that earlier? 
And um, so then I came home and asked Fred, uh, you know, Fred, uh, how much do you like as I lay dying? And at that point, Fred. Actually, what happened is she gave me a reading assignment. I did. I did. And uh, I mean, I guess I had read that story at some point, but I really hadn't read that much Faulkner. Still haven't. And uh, so I reread, uh, or maybe read for the first time, as I lay dying. And uh, so I had some idea about what it was all about. And uh, then we began to discuss what elements from that book we would uh, try to focus on. My initial idea was to focus on the containers in the book that ill contain their contents. I'd written a paper years ago about the containers and the contents being all out of sync and as I lay dying. And um, so I wanted to focus on containers. But when we started looking at the containers, in, and we're talking about everything from buckets to dough trays to wagons to coffins, all these containers in As I Lay Dying. When we started looking at those containers, they were not the strongest images in As I Lay Dying. They were not the strongest images at all. So Fred then, as he read the book as a visual artist, he uh, started pointing out images that were much stronger than the ones that I had been thinking of in terms of content. So here's what we did. This was our formal approach that has continued to be really helpful to us as we've moved several years now from that first one. Each of us rereads the piece. And as we reread, we make two lists, each of us. So there winds up being four lists. One of the list is images, just strong images from the work. The second list is phrases that particularly jump out at us, phrases that we just like. I like to include text in some of my work, not all of my work, but I particularly love the colloquial language in Faulkner. And so I really wanted to include some lines from Faulkner. So each of us made a list of images that we thought was strong, and each of us made a list of phrases that we thought was strong. We looked at those lists and then, you know, put our heads together and immediately struck off some things. Fred struck off some images that I had listed because he just didn't want to draw them. And I struck off some things that he had noticed that I didn't want to quilt. <laughs> and um, we, we would come to agreement and really sort of work one, I, I think we, we pretty much work one image at a time. Mm -hmm. And we get thoroughly through that before we start on another one. Now we've gotten a, a little, we, we're not quite as, rigorous with this, regimented with that as we were at first. But we still are back and forth a lot, looking at the image and talking about the image. Do you think the misfit should have, do you think he should be heavy or, you know, you think he should be thinner? Let's go to the text, let's go to the text, let's yeah, go we, to the text. We depend pretty heavily on the descriptive uh, wording that the that the writer has used. Fred likes and, to, Fred likes to divert, oh, he likes to stray from it too much. Oh, I do stray from it. I have to take it. him back to the text <laughs> all the time. But, but the more descriptive um, of a person or of a, an incident, uh, the more detailed the descriptive writing is, the clearer the image can become in my mind or in anybody's mind, I guess, who's reading that that text, but I like to know if the person has on a black hat, or if they're wearing jeans, or if they're, or if they're uh, have on cowboy boots, or anything like that. That is part of uh, my way, a way. It gives me a way to visualize the character, or the situation, or the environment that the action is happening in. So all those things figure in. I don't always adhere to them or pay attention to them in the final version, the final analysis, but they are there in a sense throughout the whole process. Yeah, and of course Fred's drawings are 
in black and white. I mean, they're black on white paper. And then I turn them into fabric pieces. I do a fabric pull. Uh, that is, I select the fabrics I think I might use. And I call Fred in there and say, do you think that on this day in Azalea Dye in the sky might be more this color or this color? Or do you think Duedel looks better in this color or that color? So I get Fred's advice. Usually I make those color decisions, but I certainly will ask Fred about it. And I love it when, well, when we go back to the text, I've said this before, but we go back to the text a lot and we wind up highlighting uh, imagery in the text. And I love it when we find just some little bitty something like the misfit wears silver rimmed glasses. And I've never, as many times as I taught uh, a good man is hard to find. I'd never really noticed the silver rimmed glasses. And then when I, we just really dug into that image and saw the silver rimmed glasses. And then when I finally uh, made those silver rimmed glasses, I had some silver thread and it was just so much fun to put that, the silver rimmed glasses on the misfit. But, but the color is a whole, you know, that's, when, when the drawing comes to me, that's when the color starts to happen. And that part is really fun. And then the stitching after that. I cut, we come, you know, we, we look at the color, cut out the pieces, make any adjustments we want to make, and then I start stitching things down. Yeah, and one of the interesting things is even though the writer may have, uh, may have written a very detailed description of a person or of an event, we have to decide the point of view. Yes. What, where are we looking at this from? Are we looking from behind somebody? Are we looking down on them? Yes. Are we kind of down below looking up at them? What, how are we seeing whatever the action is that's happening? And, and and uh, we may have two or three different points of view <laughs> about that, and then we discuss, well, I'll, we're looking at his back and her face. Uh, we're looking at his face and seeing this other character from the side. And of course, the, if there's more than one character in the illustration, then they are relating to each other, and we have to decide what point of view we're going to take to make that relationship come to life. Yes, An exa a great example I can think of is the p piece that we're just beginning to work on. And it's a Frankie Adams from The Member of the Wedding when she goes down to Front Avenue. And the passage describes what Frankie is wearing. She's wearing a Mexican hat, and she's wearing silver shoes and khaki Bermuda shorts. and. Um, She's looking at all the storefronts on front. The Blue Moon Cafe is there. Off in the distance is the mini winded cotton mill. She can see the river. She's looking at the brick warehouses. So I've been thinking that I want to see Frankie's back with the buildings beyond her and the mill off down to the right and the Blue Moon to the left. Kenfolk's Corner is supposed to be in there. Uh, there's a monkey and a monkey man in there. Now, Fred is not started any of these drawings yet, but we've just been talking about this. And of course the possibilities were we could have had Frankie looking, she could have been standing on front looking north toward the mill with the river on her left. Or she could have been standing on the, you know, on the right and looking south. But I keep wanting her looking west. And in the description that Kathy has just said, actually, it's not a, it's a scene in the book that's a memory. Yes. And isn't actually action that's happening in real time or in present time. It's a memory that Frankie has of something she did a few years back. Yes. So we it's like a thought bubble above Frankie's head that all this stuff is happening mm -hmm. in. Now we won't probably do it that way. Well, she's actually down there again. She's, she, she's on her second trip. Well, her treatment. memory is prompted by another visit right. to the same spot. Right. So she remembers what it was like 
before and then she remembers her feelings about it or she thinks about her feelings about it in present time. Right, and she has two different sets of clothes on. In the, in the memory scene, she has the Mexican hat, which I really want to quilt. I really want to make the Mexican hat. I don't and then like on the, the it, you don't like the Mexican hat? I did. And then in the second scene, the, the present day, as Fred's calling it, she has on a dress. So, and that's actually when she sees the monkey and the monkey man, I think. But anyway, um, the pers Fred's right, the perspective is really something that we think hard about. And in the uh, Alice Walker's Everyday Use, which we just finished, um, Fred came up with the perspective that I really liked that is not anything that I had in my head in the beginning. And we're just full face and Dee and Maggie and the house is behind them and the mother is not in the story. And of course in the story, the mother narrates the story and the mother's a huge uh, character, first person narrator. But um, yeah, that perspective is always uh, a biggie because, uh, you know, uh, it just is. And, and I'm not really an illustrator in, in that I haven't, uh, you know, thought about illustrating um, what would be pictures that would help somebody who's reading a book to understand what the action is. But that's really what is happening here with this process, that we're creating illustrations of situations and scenes and people from these pieces of literature that we're that we're describing yeah and we're also I feel uh, a strong need to retain the mood of the piece I don't want to make something I don't want to make too much fun of something I don't want to uh, although I think we're doing that to an extent but I think that the writer might have intended some of that too. Um, but we do have to think about the mood. I mean, Addie and her coffin is, Addie Bundren from As I Lay Dying, we, we recently finished a big piece of that. She's in her coffin and I wanted to put some text around her, the text she taken and left us, which is the, of course the text from the book. And I first cut it out of floral fabric and it was too festive looking for a death a coffin scene. So I took it off and um, anyway, the mood is real important to me. I, it has, the piece has to somehow reflect the mood of the scene in the book. Don't you think, Fred? Oh yeah, for sure. And sometimes the, sometimes the sky helps with that. It's, it's, to me, it's been interesting to me to see how important the sky is, even though I'm making a lot of the skies similar to each other, I think that'll be sort of a continuing yeah, a motif well, that holds them together as a series, but but the sky is important, the size you, of the sky. Well, you, you directed uh, plays for a long time, for years, and thinking about what we're doing as a stage set. Yeah. might be useful because you have to position the, the players, the characters, yeah. and you have to create a set for them to exist in, and, and yeah. that's basically what we're doing now is yeah. creating a stage set. Yeah, and of course Fred's real good. For With me. the actors. Yeah, and of course you, Fred, are the one primarily responsible for the composition, the initial composition of the piece, even though you uh, you always get my input about that, but you're where the composition really happens, and then I'm filling in the, the blanks, kind of. Um, yeah. And then, you know, drawing is so similar to stitching, but yet it's different, you know. In drawing, and I'm not somebody who draws, so I shouldn't be talking about drawing so much, but in drawing, you can have stray lines that that don't uh, work toward creating the piece. You know what I mean? In sketching, you can have stray lines. Well, in sewing, you can't really have straight, stray lines so much, I think. At least, maybe it's, the, maybe it's the neurotic me that doesn't like stray lines. I come out of a precision quilting uh, 
you know, tradition. But uh, I, I, I think I'm more inspired with these pieces by comic books than, than by um, the life. Well, there's a lot of compromising that has to be done because, uh, you know, when it comes to my drawing skills, they're not that wonderful, and there are lots of uh, so-called stray lines that appear. And then, but what I have to do is uh, keep in mind how they're going to be used, and then I try to pick the best of those mini lines and, and emphasize that so that Kathy yeah. can use that as a guide. Yeah, I didn't mean to be criticizing your drawing, but it, you know, in, in watching anybody do life sketches, there are, you know, these lines that <laughs> aren't where I would sew. So, uh, but we don't have many problems to, no, in doing we, this. We don't. We haven't thought about it. We haven't argued a lot. Well, not much. <laughs> um, there, there are discussions. There are lots of discussions about. Well, should we look at this from the back? How, who's the observer uh, here? And a bigger question, a bigger discussion is often which characters to include. Oh, yeah, you know, we sure. really debated about putting the mother in everyday use. And she's not there, but to me she is there, but she's not present on the screen. Yeah. Um, but which characters to include? Uh, if it's this, cause if, now, if it's a, a really specific scene, that's this, the text determines which characters are there. But if it's a piece that uh, is really just sort of a, a portrait or a less tied directly to the text in terms of content, then we could put in other characters if we want to. Yeah, and, and with some of the stories uh, in Southern literature, the ones we've selected uh, and continue to select, uh, sometimes there are four, five, six people and, and involved in what's going on, and that's difficult difficult to put that many figures into a space and have it make sense and sort of convey the the, the uh, reason for their action. Yeah, the intent, yeah. So uh, we generally avoid having more than two or three people at the most in, in a scene, although we've done a few where there's a wagon load of people. The more people, the more difficult it is for me, but that's okay. Um, I like to keep things I'd simple. like to challenge her ability to <laughs> I think he does pull these too. things off. Yeah. Well, I really want to do uh, Miss Amelia and Marvin Macy and Cousin Lyman from Carson McCullers' uh, Ballad of the Sad Cafe, but Fred keeps not drawing it. Well, I've got it in my head. Well, I hope you. I hope they're walking away, and Miss Amelia's in the middle, and Marvin Macy with his guitar is on one side, and Cousin Lyman's hobbling along on the other side of Miss Amelia, and she's wearing overalls, we'll and they're they're going down the road. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Although I I kind of think that maybe they should be coming toward us. Well, maybe, going away maybe from us. faces give me pause, but <laughs> they give you some pause too, whether you'll admit it or not. Um, one thing we have learned is that there are way so many scenes that, you know, there's just too many to choose from. When we, uh, we finished one last week and what do we do next? And there were just, you know, literally hundreds of scenes that we thought about doing. It's really hard to, I almost feel like calling my friend Marion and saying, Mary, and tell me what to do, <laughs> tell us what to do next, because um, there's too many to choose from. But we really like doing it, and I think we, um, and we love getting feedback on them. We love having people look at them and start talking about the piece. The, the best thing that happens is when we do something that's kind of a, uh, an illustration of a well-known part of a text that uh, people like and they look at it and they start laughing because they recognize it yeah and that makes you feel like well we've maybe we've done that pretty well if somebody can look at that picture 
and and they recall what they read. Yes, and that happens with the Flannery O'Connor piece, A Good Man is Hard to Find. Um, you did the, you drew the misfit and his two cronies and they're really cartoony and everybody who knows that story looks at it and laughs because they know that is the bad boy misfit. Now they haven't yet seen the other one you're doing of the same story where the misfit has the gun pointed at the grandmother. They're not going to laugh at that one. No, it's pretty serious. It's a serious one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about it. Just, I, I hope I'll laugh at it. Well, I hope it's not too uh, dark. It's a dark scene. It's, it's a dark story, yeah. But I look forward to the others we're going to make. Mm -hmm. And I've got one on the bulletin board in there, one on the design board just starting, and another one on your sketch, on your easel over there. So. And this is not the only thing I do, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have, I have my own uh, stuff that I do. That's that Kathy comes in and 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 gives me critiques, and so I pay attention to her on my end of things. Um, but she never draws on them. Nope, <laughs> I don't draw. I wish I could draw, but I never learned. <laughs>